So my name is Adam Boland. I'm a technical advisor at QCWare, a postdoc at UC Berkeley. And starting next fall, I'll be joining Stanford as an assistant pre professor of computer science. And today I'm going to tell you about what you need to know about quantum algorithms. So the main goal of quantum computing is to try to build quantum computers and use them to deliver practical speed ups. And there are two components necessary to achieve this. The first is quantum hardware. That's a physical quantum computer or the qubits you need to run on. But there's also a second component, which is quantum software or quantum algorithms. And today my talk is going to focus on the second part of the equation because it's also an important part of bringing quantum speedups to fruition. So in this talk, I'm going to tell you about some of the basics of quantum algorithms, namely the notions of speed up and the ideas of uh, exactly how much quantum hardware is going to be required to run these algorithms. And I'm also then going to briefly introduce some of the fundamental algorithms for optimization, chemistry, and machine learning. And what we're going to see in all of these application areas is that if we want to achieve a practical speed up in these areas with a quantum computer, this will require progress in algorithms as well as in hardware. All right, so let's dive into some of the basics of quantum algorithms. So it turns out that quantum algorithms were the initial catalyst for building quantum computers in the first place. Way back in the 1980s and early 90s, theorists realized that a hypothetical quantum computer might be able to solve certain problems much faster than the classical computer would be able to do. And this theoretical work came to fruition in 1994 when Peter Shore gave the first quantum algorithm that exponentially outperforms a classical algorithm. Namely, he gave his algorithm for factoring, factoring integers with many applications to cryptography. And in the last 20 or so years, we've learned a lot about quantum algorithms. But one of the kind of main lessons that we've learned is that quantum computers are only going to be better than classical computers at specific computational tasks. So it's not like buying a faster CPU where you know, that's something that would speed up all computations uniformly. Rather, there's something that requires some particular mathematical structure to your problem in order to provide a speed up. And it turns out that it's quantum algorithms that determine which computational tasks are amenable to quantum speedups and exactly how much speedup can be achieved for those tasks. So when you're considering quantum algorithms and you know, a quantum algorithm and whether it's relevant to your particular application, there are kind of two key factors that you need to keep in mind. The first factor is how much speedup does the quantum algorithm provide? So this controls how much impact the quantum algorithm could have on your time to solution for that particular problem. So quantum speedups fall into two categories. The first are proven speedups. These are quantum algorithms for which we have a mathematical proof that the algorithm will find the solution very quickly. In fact, quicker than the best known classical algorithm. And these proven speedups can fall into two categories. Uh, Computer science theorists call them polynomial versus exponential theorists, referring to how these speedups scale as you increase problem size. But in terms of practical impact, they really correspond to speedups with a moderate impact versus speedups with a very high impact on your particular time to solution for your problem. The second category of algorithms are quantum heuristic algorithms. For these algorithms, we don't know if or how much speed up these will provide for your particular problem. So there's no mathematical proof or no mathematical performance guarantees for these algorithms. But the hope is that when you run these algorithms on your particular problem, that you'll, you'll be able to see whether or not the quantum algorithm you know, will actually provide a, an advantage in terms of time to solution. And thus far, we haven't had large enough of quantum computers or high enough quality quantum computers to run these heuristics on any problems that are large enough to be commercially relevant. So we haven't yet seen what's going to happen with these algorithms. The second factor you need to keep in mind is the hardware requirements for running the algorithm. And this factor determines exactly when this quantum algorithm will become relevant to your application. So here, the controlling factor that controls the time frame for commercial relevance is how noise tolerant the algorithm is. So current prototype quantum computers are highly noisy. 
And for certain algorithms, they really cannot tolerate this, this noise. So these algorithms require very low noise qubits or very high quality qubits to run successfully, far higher quality than the ones we have today. So it appears that we might need to implement something called quantum error correction in order to run these algorithms. And quantum error correction incurs very high overheads, both in terms of number of qubits and clock speeds, which means that these algorithms have very high hardware requirements and are not good candidates for running in the next few years. On the other hand, other algorithms are naturally noise tolerant, and these are algorithms which can be run in the noisy intermediate scale or NISC near-term quantum era. So these algorithms, we would say, have relatively low hardware requirements. And we can now plot the space of quantum algorithms on the 2D axis based on these two factors that you need to consider when you're evaluating a quantum algorithm for your application. So the first axis, the y-axis, is the amount of speed up the quantum algorithm provides over classical solutions. And here the speed up can be either unknown or heuristic or moderate or high. And on the x-axis, we'll plot the quantum hardware required to run the algorithm. So on the left-hand side, we'll have algorithms with low hardware requirements, which can be run on on the right, algorithms with relatively high hardware requirements. Now, ideally, we'd like to find quantum algorithms in the upper left-hand quadrant of this, of this chart. So these would be algorithms which have a high impact and which are runnable in the next few years on prototype devices. But unfortunately, if you look at where existing quantum algorithms lie on this chart, they all either lie on the upper right-hand quadrant of the chart. So these are algorithms which have proven speedups, but they require relatively high amounts of quantum hardware, both either in terms of quality or quantity of qubits in order to execute. On the other hand, all of the algorithms that we have that we can run in the next few years, which are noise tolerant, these are algorithms which are heuristic in nature. So we don't know the extent to which they'll provide a speedup. So you can see that the upper left-hand quadrant of this chart is missing. Let's say we don't have algorithms with proven speedups that we can run in the next few years. So one of the main goals of quantum algorithms research is to try to push this frontier forward. And you know, ideally, you might hope that we could push it, you know, the goal might be to push it all the way to the upper left-hand side, that is to find you know, these exponential speedups in the next few years. But the more realistic or moderate goal is to try to push things towards the middle of the diagram. That is to see, try to see if we can trade some of the speedups in these algorithms with proven speedups for lower hardware requirements or vice versa. And then with, by doing so, we're hoping to bring forward the timeline at which these algorithmic speedups become relevant. Now, this is all very abstract. So in the remaining amount of my talk, I'm going to show you how this quantum algorithms landscape has developed over the last few years in three application areas, starting with quantum algorithms for optimization. So optimization is ubiquitous in industry. So it comes up, you know, optimization problems are, are really frequent in say logistics problems like routing and scheduling. They also appear very frequently in finance, for instance, in portfolio optimization. And the proven speedups that we have for optimization problems tend to be derivatives of a particular algorithm that's called Grover's algorithm, which was first discovered in the 90s, which provides a very generic polynomial speedup for many optimization tasks. And this is an algorithm um, that has since been developed. So there, there are many different derivatives of this algorithm which have kind of extended this Grover speed up to cover many different classical optimization methods, which I'll discuss more shortly. On the other hand, there have also been developed two prominent near-term heuristics um, for quantum optimization. The first is called the quantum annealing algorithm. So this is an algorithm that's designed to run on, on a special type of quantum hardware called the quantum annealer, such as those produced by D-Wave. And then there's also an algorithm called the Quantum Approximate Optimization Algorithm, or QAOA. And this algorithm is designed to run on circuit-based quantum computing machines. 
Now, the the algorithms landscape and optimization has evolved substantially in the last few years. So if you want to see what this landscape looked like around five years ago, you know, there was Grover's algorithm, which has a proven polynomial or moderate speed up, but that algorithm has extremely high hardware requirements. It's very far in the future in terms of implementation. So on the other hand, there are these two heuristic algorithms. First, quantum annealing, which has relatively low hardware requirements, and also QAOA, which shortly after it was invented, briefly was believed to actually outperform the best possible classical algorithm on a particular optimization task. Now, what happened over the last five years is this landscape has shifted. So first, you know, all of these algorithms have come slightly closer to reality as quantum hardware has matured. But we've also seen some of these algorithms kind of move in their relative, uh, our belief in their speed ups and their relative hardware requirements. So for example, QAOA, um, right after the, there was this quantum paper showing that it outperformed the best known classical algorithm, then a bunch of classical algorithm theorists got together and actually showed that that there was actually a classical algorithm outperforming the QAOA on that problem. So that kind of downgraded the QAOA speedup from a proven speedup to a heuristic speedup. And there was also some evidence that suggested that it might have slightly hardware, higher hardware requirements as well, which shifted it a bit to the right. At the same time, there's also been work being done to take Grover's algorithm and try to make it slightly more practically relevant both by using it as a subroutine in many classical heuristic solvers like branch and bound algorithms, but also to try to come up with lower depth versions of Grover's algorithm, which have lower hardware requirements, but which also sacrifice some of the speed up of the algorithm as well in order to achieve those hardware requirements. So you can see that, there, that this landscape is kind of constantly evolving um, as, as time progresses. All right, so that's all I'm going to say about quantum algorithms for chemistry. So next, I'm going to briefly cover some of the basics of quantum algorithms. Mean, that's all I'm going to say about optimization. Next, I'm going to cover some of the basics of quantum algorithms for chemistry. So quantum chemistry is actually one of the original applications of quantum computers. It's part of the reason that Richard Feynman in the 80s uh, envisioned uh, as, as one of the primary reasons for building them. And our quantum algorithms for chemistry try to solve two different types of chemical problems. The first are problems involving quantum dynamics. These are trying to understand how quantum systems evolve with time, like issues like protein folding or catalyzation, how that actually happens in real time. And the second are quantum algorithms for trying to compute the properties of chemicals which are at equilibrium. Say they're trying to understand the ground state or the electronic structure of certain molecules. And our proven uh, our quantum algorithms with proven speedups for chemistry all solve problems uh, that are of the force first type. So that's to say they solve problems regarding quantum dynamics. So the first one of these algorithms came out in the 1990s. It's an algorithm called Hamiltonian simulation. And since then, there have been many developments and improvements of, of the Hamiltonian simulation algorithm. But this is an algorithm which is believed to deliver an exponential speed up over classical computing. On the other hand, a number of near-term heuristics have been developed, namely the variational quantum eigensolver, or VQE. And the goal of these near-term heuristics is to solve algorithms, solve problems of the second type which are algorithms trying to compute chemical properties uh, at equilibrium. Now, if, you're to, if you want to kind of plot how these algorithms look on the algorithm landscape, five years ago, uh, Hamiltonian simulation, you know, it's an exponential speed up, but it has relatively high hardware requirements. And on the other hand, BQE, when it was first invented, looked like it had low to moderate hardware requirements, but it's a heuristic algorithm with an unknown amount of speed up. If you fast forward this picture to today, we can see that uh, some things have changed. So the first is that Hamiltonian simulation algorithms have become more efficient. So there's been a lot of work in trying to figure out, you know, can we try to minimize the amount of resources required to run this algorithm? And this has substantially reduced the resources needed here 
though it still is relatively far away in terms of implementation. Now, on the other hand, there have been a number of developments in BQE to try to decrease the hardware requirements of BQE, you know, both in terms of trying to fit a larger chemical problem onto a smaller physical quantum computer, and also in terms of trying to decrease the number of measurements or shots that you need to perform with your quantum experiment. I'll, I'll call these BQE++ to capture a number of improvements on BQE. And these have shifted BQE a bit to the left in terms of hardware requirements, but it still remains a heuristic algorithm. All right, next I'll try to briefly cover quantum algorithms for machine learning. So I don't need to tell you that machine learning has a huge number of applications in industry from image processing to uh, natural language processing to clustering and unsupervised learning, et cetera, et cetera. And our quantum algorithms for machine learning fall into two broad families. All of our proven speedups for quantum machine learning are based on uh, speedups of quantum linear algebra. So back in 2014, it was first realized that quantum computers can perform certain linear algebra operations, like solving linear systems, faster than classical computers are able to. And based on this, there, you know, since linear algebra is so common in machine learning, there have been a number of subsequent quantum algorithms developed for a wide range of machine learning tasks, uh, such as net recommendation systems, as in the Netflix problem, convex optimization, clustering, reinforcement learning, et cetera, et cetera. On the other hand, we've also seen the development of near-term heuristics for machine learning. Namely, the, the principal algorithm here is called quantum neural networks. So here the idea is that instead of training a classical neural network to say, you know, recognize images of a particular form, instead you tried to train a quantum circuit or a quantum algorithm to recognize those images. And if we plot how these uh, algorithms have evolved on the landscape, um, so quantum neural networks you know, are a heuristic. And when recommendation systems first came out, we thought that they provided an exponential speed up over classical computing, but they had very high hardware requirements because they assumed access to something called QRAM or quantum random access memory, which, uh, which there has not yet been even a prototype implementation of. But a lot happened in the intervening five years in the machine learning landscape. So, you know, first, hardware improved, so everything shifted left. But second, there was developed a classical algorithm by, by Tang, which showed that these recommendation systems actually only provide a polynomial speedup instead of an exponential speedup over classical computers. At the same time, there was this proliferation of a large number of quantum linear algebra-based QML algorithms, uh, such as clustering and classifiers. And kind of the current landscape is people are trying to take these algorithms with, uh, based on quantum linear algebra and try to decrease their hardware requirements by trying to get rid of this assumption that you need access to QRAM in order to do so. And the hope here is that maybe you can trade off some of your performance here well, to still get a polynomial speed up for your problem, but, but don't require QRAM, which is still looks very far in the future. All right, so let me uh, wrap up now. So I've shown you this quantum algorithms landscape now for three different application areas of quantum computing, uh, optimization, chemistry, and machine learning. And what we've seen that in each one of them, there's this quantum algorithmic frontier that controls how much speed up we can achieve for these particular uh, applications, and also when that speed up will be relevant, which is controlled by the hardware requirements of those particular algorithms. And the goal in quantum algorithms research going forward should be to push this frontier further in order to help bring forward the date at which these algorithms provide practical impact in industry. All right, and that's all. Uh, thank you very much for your time.